night, Louis Hernandez, right? Where's he at? Where's he at? He's back here. And uh, he'd been to Bible college, and he came through y'all's school right here. And uh, he told me he can do a super job, and he's going to have one of the best sermons he's ever preached tonight. And so I want you to be here tonight and hear him. So I want you all to be here and encourage him. Always encourage people. Always, you know, they, 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 everybody needs it. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans in chapter 9. Romans and chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Now, we're going to take and uh, cover some very controversial scripture. Now, the scriptures are not controversial. It's people. And uh, they have various views on scripture. And I'm going to give you mine. I do believe there is such a thing as predestination and foreknowledge. Predestination is an act of God. That's what he does. And foreknowledge is an attribute of God. That's what he knows. So one's what he knows, one's what he does. And just because God knows something doesn't mean God made it happen. See, God may know that you're going to rob a 7-Eleven store tomorrow, but don't blame God if you do it. God didn't make you do that. He just simply knew what you were going to do. And so as you look at these scriptures, I want you to stay with me now. The whole message, if you daydream for 30 seconds, you're lost. And you have to get saved again. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> But I do want you to follow me. In Romans in chapter 9, look there in verse 11. Excuse me, uh, verse 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, verse 12, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now, why did he do that? Well, look in verse 11. He says, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Now, when you read these verses, it seems like if God is God and he's powerful, he's sovereign, God can do whatever he wants to do, and everybody in the world being born into this world, God can choose to save who he wants to save, and if he wants to let the rest of them go to hell, then God can do that. Who's the one to challenge God and say, God, you did something wrong? And so the question comes down, is there unrighteousness with God? Oh, see what he says in verse 14? What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? No. If God is righteous and God is perfect, can God do anything wrong? No. Then the problem is going to be in our understanding of God and not because of what God literally did that was wrong. He said, well, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's fair. You're not God. And in your judgment, if you don't agree with God, you're wrong. Duh. Because God can't be wrong. So when you don't agree with God, you see, now the question comes in is what does God really say in? Do we understand what he says? So why did God say that he, he loves one and he hates one? See there in verse 13? Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. That don't sound right. Before they were ever born, before they did any good or evil, God chose? Well, that don't sound fair. You see, that's in our mind because we don't understand how God chooses. So I want to show you how God chooses, why he does what he does, the way that he does it. So look at verse 15. He says, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou will say then, in other words, like God said, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. He says, this is what you're thinking. Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? In other words, if everybody does whatever God wants them to do, then how can you find fault with us? You made us like this. In other words, we're nothing more than some little puppet on the end of a string, and you're just up there pulling strings, and we really didn't choose anything. You programmed us this way. So how can you find fault with any decision that I made? You made me, and I'm the way that you made me, so therefore... Uh, how can you find fault? You see, that's how we would think. Have you ever heard that song? Um, 
Whatever will be, will be. My future's not ours to see. You see, yeah, I remember Doris Day singing that. Now, the way that song really goes is not that way. Because, see, when I originally wrote it, it went like this. <laughs> when I was just a little boy, I asked my father, what will I be? Will I be handsome? Will I be rich? Here's what he said to me. No. <laughs> so whatever will be, will be. N no. You see, well, it seems like God has already programmed everything. And so, does God already know who's going to heaven? Well, yes. Does God know who's going to hell? Well, of course. Well, then how can I change that? How can I change what God already knows? If God knows who's going to heaven and God knows who's going to hell, why do I got a witness? They're going to get there one way or the other. Regardless of what I do. Now, if you don't understand it, it'll put you to sleep concerning very important truths. And you won't witness because, well, I don't need to. It won't make any difference anyway. You see, as a Christian, if you don't understand it, that's why you won't pray. Because, you see, it sure seems like fatalistic predestination to me that God has chosen to save some and let the rest of the world go to hell and there's nothing you can do about it. If I believe that, I would have a very difficult time serving God. I would have a very difficult time passing out of track or witnessing. I'd have a difficult time talking to God about my problems. Wouldn't be no need to. I'm just a puppet anyway. So how do you explain all of this? Why does God take of the clay and make a vessel of wrath and make a vessel of mercy? Because, see, God wants to show his wrath and God wants to show his mercy. So God uses people to show his wrath upon and his mercy. But what makes God make the right decision? How does he choose? Now, here's what some people believe. Here's me, and uh, there's Chris. He's standing right here. And God has chosen to save me and let Chris go to hell. I don't see anything wrong with that. You would if you were Chris. He said, now what, what caused God to make this choice? Why did God choose to save me and not save Chris? Because I'm better looking. <laughs> now I'm shorter and I can get in the door. He's too tall. There's got to be some. Now if God is not a respecter of person, and he says in the word he's not a respecter of person, so why did God choose to save me and not save him? Is he a respecter of persons? There's got to be a reason. And what caused him to make that decision? If that's what he did. Now remember this. If God being God, and he is, and as God in the very beginning could look down through that long telescope of time, and God sees all these people upon the earth, and God says, I'm going to save this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, and the rest of them, I'm going to let them go to hell. Is that what God did? No, that's not what God did. Let me explain some things to you. I want you to take your Bible and look there in the book of Ephesians chapter 1. The book of Ephesians and chapter 1. Whatever you do, don't take a nap. One person in church fell asleep. And I said, would you wake up that person? He says, you put them to sleep, you wake them up. In Ephesians in chapter 1, I want you to notice something. Look in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath, get this, chosen us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So it pleased God to make a choice. It says that he has chosen us before the foundations of the world. If God is God. And he made a choice. Well, that's what he said over there in the book of um, 
Romans in chapter 9, before they did any good or any bad, God had chose one he loved and one he hated. Boy, that don't sound too good. How do you explain that with John 3, 16? For God so loved the world. Remember this. God hates sin. God hates the sinful nature in man. God loves the man, but he hates the sin, and he hates the sinful nature of man. God hates the sins of the flesh, but can love the person. When you get into these scriptures and you see it seems like it says this, you always look, there might be a key word or a key verse in a context. Look in verse 4 again. According as he hath chosen up, and look at those next two words, in him. Those two words, you ought to underline them. Because God, from the very beginning, has chosen all those that are in Christ to be made pure and holy and without blemish, perfected, and ordained that they are going to be blessed by God in heaven and will receive his righteousness. But God chose all of those that are in Christ. Now, the question comes down is, how do you get in Christ? God has chosen to take all of those who believe on Jesus Christ. If you trust Christ as your Savior, he has chosen to take you and place you in Christ. And God has chosen all those that are in Christ. They get to go to heaven. So predestination is an act of God. And predestination is the security of the believer. So when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, God saved me, put me in Christ. But he's already determined for the foundation of the world. Before I did any good or any bad, he has decided that he's going to take all of those that are in Christ and they are the ones that are going to be made pure and holy before him. Those are his children. Now, it is my decision and your decision to decide, do I want to be in Christ? Do I want to believe on Christ? So John 3.16 is still true. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, anybody, whosoever, believeth, should not perish but have everlasting life. So I believed it, I have everlasting life. So God didn't override my will. God simply in the very beginning before man was ever created, chose to save all those who trust Christ and to reject those who reject Christ. It boils down to what did you do with Jesus Christ? So it is our choice, and we are making that choice. It is a deliberate choice that we make, and we are held accountable for that decision. God knows that your heart is rebellious to him. So God can allow things to happen in your life that hardens you more and more and more. And it is the will of God in order to show his wrath to use a vessel of wrath. In other words, those who harden themselves against God don't want the will of God for life. God is free to use them to demonstrate his wrath upon but everyone who trusts Christ as their Savior and accepts God's mercy, then God says these are vessels of mercy. So God is free to bless them and give them whatever he wants to give them. But you and I are the one that decide, do I want to harden myself against God or do I want to be obedient and believe what he said? And so if I trust Christ as my Savior, God is free to give me eternal life. God is free to give me his righteousness, his wisdom. He can give me a home in heaven, a new body, and he can give me all those things because I'm in Christ. That's what he chose to do. I do not believe that God has chosen this person to go to hell and that person to go to heaven and you had no choice in it. That I do not believe is taught in the scriptures. Now, unless you listen to me all the way, you might think that I'm saying something I'm not saying. Because I can read the scriptures and you can make it say this and you can make it say that. You hear that all the time. But in its context, it'll say what it means. And it means what it says. Now, think for a moment. Here you are and uh, you, you die. 
and you go to heaven and you walk in through those pearly gates. It's always pearly gates. And when you get in, you see, on this side of the gate it says, whosoever will may come. So you walk in through the pearly gates. And you walk in there and you turn around and you look on this side. Chosen before the foundations of the world. God chose me before the foundation of the world. Hey, that's all right. But the man that goes to hell, and when he goes to hell, it says, whosoever believeth not is condemned. The wrath of God abides upon him. And he goes to hell. And he looks back over the sign, chosen to go to hell before the foundations of the world. Now, if you went to heaven, you don't mind that sign. But if you go to hell, you ain't going to like that sign. You say, I didn't have a choice. I, I, I really didn't, it didn't matter what I did. I was chosen to go to hell before I was born. That ain't right. And you will judge God. God has to be just when he is judged by the unjust. God still has to be right. Now, that sign isn't the truth. Because, see, it's whosoever will. If you choose to accept Christ as Savior, you can have eternal life and go to heaven. If you reject Christ as your Savior, you'll spend an eternity in hell. It did not have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. Now, take your Bible and turn to the book of John, chapter 4. The Gospel of John in chapter 4. The Gospel of John, chapter 4. And you've read these scriptures many times, but there's one thing I want to show you. In 1 John chapter 4, look there in verse 10. In verse 10, it makes this statement. Jesus answered and said unto her, the woman at the well, the one that had had five husbands and was living with a man that wasn't her husband. Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, Thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Jesus says, if you knew about the gift and who it is, me, you would have asked, and I would have given. Does God know ahead of time who will ask and who won't ask? It says right here, he knew that if you knew, you would have asked, and I would have given. That's what he told the woman at the well. She did ask, and he did give. She believed she receives the gift of eternal life. It's so important to understand what God has done for us. God is not willing that any person should perish, but that every soul, every person would trust Christ as Savior. Did Christ really die for every man? I believe so. First Timothy, and you don't have to turn there, but in chapter 2 and verse 6, it says that he is not willing that any should He wants every man to believe on him, all men to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish. But you see, if they didn't have a choice, well, he could save all of them if he wanted to. If he can pick this one and this one and this one and this one and this one, then why didn't he just pick all of them and save them all? Nobody would have had to perish if he didn't want them to perish. I mean, he made the rules. But he says, only those who believe on Christ have eternal life. And those that do not believe do not have eternal life. Look there in John in chapter 3 and verse 18. Just a little bit to your left. John 3, look in verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned when? Already. What? Because he hath not believed. Not because he wasn't chosen. Because he didn't believe. That's why he's lost. He hasn't believed. And he says, who is saved? He that does believe. Look there in verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. So it boils down to, did you or did you not believe on Jesus Christ? That means, did you believe that he died on that cross, paid for all of your sins, and you are trusting him as your Savior, and God said he would save you? Whosoever believeth is up to the individual. That's why whenever I heard the gospel when I was 18 years old, that was the best news I ever heard in my life. 
I didn't understand a lot of things, but I knew I was a sinner, and I knew I was going to go to hell if I didn't trust Christ as my Savior. And you know what scares me more than anything else in the world? Is the day that I trusted the Lord, I could have said no just as easy as I said yes. I could have said no. You may be here this morning, and you'll hear how to have eternal life and go to heaven when you die. And you'll go out those doors, and you may trust Christ as your Savior. And you may not. It'll be your choice. But you will not be able to blame God. Can't blame God. Because God loves you. He provided eternal life for you. But it's your choice to accept it or to reject it. God doesn't force himself on anybody. He wants you to believe that he did it for you. That he loved you that much. And will you trust him as your Savior? See, God is sovereign. It means that God can do whatever God wants to do. Now, God cannot sin. God can't send me to hell. So there's some things God can't do because he is God. He can't do wrong. But God is sovereign. And in his sovereignty, because he's God, in his sovereignty, he chose to give to man a free will. In other words, where you can choose heaven or hell. Think for a moment. You have trusted Christ as your Savior. Does God have a purpose for your life? A will for your life? Look there in the book of Ephesians in chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And look there in verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So salvation, in these two verses, says what it is and what it is not. It is by grace. It is by faith. It is the gift. But it's not of works. It's not of yourself. Now, let's say you trust Christ as your Savior. As a child of God, look in verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Is it the will of God that all of his children walk in good works? Yes. Does that mean they're going to? No. So God doesn't get everything God wants. God doesn't get everything he wants. He wants us to love him, but you may choose not to love him. God wants you to walk with him, to serve him, to witness but you may not. Because God chose in his sovereignty to give you a free will. He has already predetermined that if his children will obey him, not to get to heaven, but because they're his children, he promised that he would bless our lives and reward us when we get to heaven. You have the choice to obey or disobey. If you obey God, then God will use you as a vessel of mercy and grace and bestow that upon you. God decided this before we were ever born, before we did any good or bad. But as a child of God, if you choose to be rebellious to the Lord and you don't want the will of God for your life, God had predetermined before the foundation of the world, then God can use you, even though you're his child, to demonstrate his wrath upon. Can you as a child of God, can God chasten you? Can God take you home before your time? Can God bring evil things and allow evil things to come into your life? Yes, he can. The scriptures are full of it. We have a God who made decisions before he ever made the man and says this is how it's going to be. He let heaven and hell be dependent upon our choice. And God determined that after we trust him as our Savior... We can choose to be a vessel that he can use or one that he might have to put on the shelf. You may have known Christ as your Savior for years and have never accomplished anything for God. And God has simply put you on a shelf. Can't be used. Not faithful. And then there'll be others who'll come along, they'll trust Christ as Savior, and they'll love the Lord and get involved and want to do everything they possibly can for the Lord, and God will use them and God will bless them, and a lot of people's lives will be changed. You say, well, that's because God gave me none, because they were faithful. It's not according to your talents and your abilities. 
It's according to faithfulness. God is simply looking for some dedicated nobodies. Not people who are, think they're better than everybody else. You know those big eyes and little U's? No. Everybody put your feet on the floor the same way. And I really don't care how high you jump and how loud you holler. As long as when your feet touch the ground, you're walking straight and speaking a language I can understand. So the Bible tells us these things that helps us to know how God chooses. I know now that if I choose to serve the Lord, God is bound by his word. He must bless my life. And he has to reward me when I get to heaven. You see, he don't have a choice now. He done made the choice. And his word is above his name. And he can't change it. He cannot alter his word. The word of God is perfect. Doesn't need any correction. It only needs us to believe it. Look there in Romans in chapter 8. Romans in chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, very quickly, look there in verse 28. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together. Get this, and you ought to underline this in your Bible. All things work together for good to them that love God. Now see, not all of God's children will love God. So all things are not going to work together for your good. But if you love the Lord, all things work together for good. Now get the rest of it who are the called according to his purpose. In other words, God knows what he's trying to make out of your life. I used this illustration before, but I'll just run it by you. You're going to make a cake. I ain't got a clue how to make a cake. But I know that there's some people that know how to make cakes, and they take some flour and a little lard and some salt and some this and some of that and some eggs and whatever. You get all these ingredients. But if you were to take some of these ingredients by themselves... I mean, how would you like it? Honey, here's, here's your piece of pie. And here's a mouthful of flour. Take that first. How do you like that, honey? <laughs> okay. Here's a mouthful of lard. Take some. Uh, here's some salt. Take some salt. And you take each one of those individually by themselves. Yuck. But if you take the right amount of each one and you put them all together, lo and behold, you got yourself a cake. And it tastes good. God knows what he's trying to make out of your life. And so God is allowing you to have a little flour and a little lard and a little salt and a little pepper and a little egg and a little this and a little that. And God knows what. But if you take all the things that are happening in your life individually, you say, boy, this is a rotten life. God, if you love me, you wouldn't let this happen. Look, God ain't finished yet. He's cooking you. <laughs> and everything takes time, heat, and pressure. Because God knows what he's trying to... He's trying to build some character into your life. And he gives every individual personalized attention. He said, God just don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> oh, yeah, he does. And he's watching. And God can bless or withhold his blessings because of your obedience or your disobedience. You're making very, very important decisions in your life that affects you for not only this life, but for all eternity. God... Is good. Now look at the last next verse. Look in verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. You see what you were predestinated for? Not to be saved. You were predestinated to be conformed to the because God has predetermined that all those who trust Christ as Savior are going to be just like his son. But you're the one that decides do you want to trust Christ as your Savior or not? Will you allow the Lord to work in your life so that he can now conform you into the image of his son? That's why God is doing what he's doing in your life because he's trying to conform you to something. You're already saved. You have eternal life. But maybe you don't, you don't act like a Christian. So God is going to allow things to happen in your life to drive you to him so that you can be the way God wants you to be. Now, so in verse 30, moreover, whom he did predestinate whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, he justified, and whom he justified, them he glorified, and uh, what shall we say to them? If God is for us, who can be? You know, if this is what God wants, who are you and me to say anything different? Am I supposed to stand in judgment? God, God, that's not fair. I can't see how it could be any other way. Sounds pretty good to me. 
But see, if I have a false understanding of this, yeah, I can see error all the way through it. But that's not what God said, and that's not what God did. That's because people don't read and study the Scriptures to see what the, God's really saying. You've got to put it together. Put it together. And then it will make a lot of sin. Uh, take your Bible, look at Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, and look there in verse 37. Verse 37. And you notice here in verse 37, Jesus overlooking the city of Jerusalem said this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stoneth them which are sent unto thee, I understand why you did it, because you had no choice. I programmed you this way, and therefore I can't hold you responsible. Is that what he said? See, he didn't say that. This is what he said. He said, and stoneth them which are sin of thee, how often, get this, how often would I have gathered thy children together? Even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you ought to underline these last three words, ye would not. It didn't say you could not. He says you would not. He says, how often I would have done this, but you wouldn't do what you should have done. He put it right back. In other words, if they were programmed that way, then why blame them for something they do that they didn't have a choice in? Because that's not what God does. They had choices they could have made. They didn't have to kill all those prophets. They didn't have to kill Christ when he came. But God, knowing what people were going to do, could write it and have it in prophet. Him. This is what they're going to do to me. Not because I made them do it, but because that's their choice to do it. And then he says this, didn't he say about Judas, it would have been better for that man if he had never been, if it had never been born. Not because well, he could have trusted the Lord, go to heaven just like anybody else, but he made choices. All of life is making choices. But he says, and ye would not. Take your Bible, look in John chapter 5, the gospel of John in chapter 5. John chapter 5. And look there in verse 39. Verse 39. Here it makes the statement in verse 39. This is on page 1121 in an old school for reference Bible, the Bible that was loaned to you here in the service. Verse 39 says, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. The Scriptures point you to Christ. So if you're going to do anything, accept Christ. You say you believe the Bible... Well, then believe what it said. So he says there in verse 40, and get this, you ought to underline it, ye will not come to me that you might have life. In other words, it wasn't you couldn't come because I didn't program you, I didn't choose you. No, no, he says you will not come to me that you might have life. You could have eternal life, but you won't believe. You see, it's your choice. Things that have happened to you in your life, a lot of it didn't have to happen. You made wrong decisions. Own up to it and say, I made bad, but don't blame God. Don't get bitter at God. God doesn't do wrong. God doesn't sin. He wrongs no man. The devil wants to turn you against God because if he can get you mad at God, you won't trust him as your Savior. And if you're a Christian, you're not going to serve him and be faithful to him because, well, he doesn't keep his word. I prayed and, and this didn't happen and that didn't happen because you won't walk with God and be found faithful to the Lord. God doesn't fail. He said, I'll never fail you. Now, either he said it or he didn't say it, but he said it. And God cannot lie. I'll never leave you. Oh, I love this. Scriptures. <laughs> Look in verse 40 one more time. And ye will not come to me that you might have life. Now, here you are this morning. You've come to church, and here you are, and you maybe have never understood how to have eternal life. The only thing you have to do to go to heaven is admit that you're a sinner and can't save yourself and believe that Christ can save you and you trust him and he'll give you eternal life. And you can go to heaven whenever you die. You can't get it any simpler than that. You see, it's just like if I offered you this microphone and you accept you'd have a microphone. If I offered you my Bible and you accept you'd have a Bible. Well, if Christ walks in here and offers you eternal life and you accept you'd have eternal life and if it's eternal life it lasts forever if it lasts forever and all your sins are paid where would you go when you die well you'd go to heaven 
And that's all you have to, all you got to do is believe it. Believe it. He did it for you. Nobody can make you do it. Nobody can stop you from believing it if you choose to believe it. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians and chapter 2. I want to throw this verse in here because it's a very good verse that many people get twisted and bent out of shape on. But it doesn't have to be that way. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, look there in verse 13. Verse 13. So page 1272. Verse 13 says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Uh-oh, there it says right there in the Bible, God chose you to salvation. You say, oh, now you've messed up everything you said. And some people will take that and they'll ride that hobby horse clean in the ground. But they don't finish the verse. Look what he says. God hath chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. And what's the next words? Belief of the truth. God chose to save all of those who believe the truth. And he makes you pure and holy by the Holy Spirit. Duh. It's not hard to understand. The scriptures, remember, is easier to understand when you keep the gospel simple. The gospel is the lens by which you discern the rest of scripture. If these are milky and cloudy, then you don't see anything else clear. But when you understand that God does so love the world, and that all you had to do is trust Christ as Savior, God give you eternal life, ah, that's the best news in the world. Look up here. This hand represents you and me, and the wall represents sin. And, and this hand represents God. The Bible says, for he, God, hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. See, he knew no sin, but he was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, in him. So whenever you trust Christ as your Savior, God says you are placed in him by your faith alone. And God has chosen to save all those who believe it. And those who believe, he has chosen to put them in Christ and says, these will be made pure and holy and stand before me in heaven and will be his children and blah, blah, blah. We have received the adoption of children. It's easy to understand. But if you reject Christ as your Savior, then you spend an eternity separated from God in a literal fire burning hell. And it didn't have to be that way. Because God loved you. All you had to do is believe it. But you chose not to. Now, the Bible says this. You and I are all sinners. It means everybody's in the same boat. God is not a respecter of persons. But he says, because of sin, we have to pay for it. And the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God in hell. Now, to go to heaven, we have to be perfect as righteous as God. And none of us are perfect. We've all done things wrong. God says you can't save yourself. You see, you don't have to go to church to go to heaven. You don't have to give any money to go to heaven. You can't earn your way. So Christ came. This hand representing Christ came into the world, had no sin. He loves us, but he hates our sin because it separates us from him. So Christ took the sin, paid for it on the cross, came back from the dead and said, if you and I, if we will believe, he did it for us. So when I was 18 years and I, old and I heard this for the first time, I believed he did it for me. And so he put that payment to my account. I get to go to heaven on what he did. I didn't earn it, didn't work for it, don't deserve it. So God allowed me to be a vessel of mercy. And he showed mercy upon me. There's others who will reject Christ as Savior. And he said, he that believeth not the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. And so there's vessels of wrath. So God has chosen those who reject Christ to be a vessel of wrath upon whom he is going to show his anger and his hatred for sin. But it's a choice that we make. And nobody can make it for you. Every person is held accountable to God.
You can't blame your mom and your dad. You can't blame your brothers and sisters. It's all an individual thing. You say, well, my mama treated me bad or my dad was this. And I'm not interested and don't want to hear it. It has nothing to do with you. You are an individual. God is going to hold each of us accountable. Did you or did you not trust Christ as your Savior? It doesn't matter if you don't like the church, you don't like preachers, you don't like anything. If you die without Christ, it's forever. And it doesn't have to be that way. I want you to trust the Lord. Because I'm sure glad I did. I know I'm going to heaven because God had predetermined that all those who trust Him as Savior, He'd give me eternal life and they'll go to heaven when He dies. And He said before anybody was ever born, did any good or bad, if you trust Christ as a Savior, He says, I'll never cast you out and I'll never lose you. You can know that you're going to heaven before you die. I know I'm going to heaven. Why? Because God said, God made the heavens and the earth. He already explained it in His book. Can't go against it. Boy, that's good news. Let's pray, shall we? With heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around. Would you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you've never done it, don't you think right now would be a good time? I'm not going to have you forward, not going to embarrass you. I am going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand. Raising your hand is just to let me know that what I said made sense to you. And you're saying, preacher, that made sense to me, and I'll trust Christ as my Savior, and I'd like for you to pray for me. I want to know if you trust Christ as your Savior. And it's just a way for you to let me know. So in the quietness of this moment, with heads bowed and eyes closed, would you right now say something simple like this? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I believe you died on that cross and paid for my sins, and I'm going to trust you right now as my Savior. And preacher, I want you to pray for me. Would you slip your hand up very quickly and put it right back down? Is there anyone at all? Just slip it up very quickly and put it right back down. No gimmicks. No axe to grind. No embarrassment. Anyone before we close? If you have trusted Christ as your Savior, do you see why getting people under the sound of the gospel is so important? Next Sunday is a good Sunday. We're going to have some dinner. We're going to feed some people. Fight a neighbor. Get somebody to come. I'll try to make the gospel clear, but we can work together on this. But I need you. You can't catch fish in the bathtub if there's no fish in the bathtub. Our Father, we thank you so much for all you've done for us. We thank you for this day and ask your blessings upon us. And thank you for this day, this service, and each person.